Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. I see there's a podium there which uh, enhances people's height, and I don't think I need that. So I might need to to shift it so that I'm uh, of the uh, requisite height. And thank you very much, uh, Program Director, who is also the Deputy Consular General of the People's Republic of China, responsible for Johannesburg and the Free State, uh, basically uh, representing the Chinese Embassy and the Consular General Zodong Tang is one of the most committed diplomats that South Africa has ever got to host. I want to thank uh, the Consular General's office for inviting the EFF to participate in this symposium about the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of China which is undeniably one of the most important gatherings in the entire world. So the CPC Congress in contemporary geopolitical considerations is the most important gathering, even more than the UN General Assembly, which in many instances takes resolutions that do not get implemented. The UN General Assembly with a vote of 186 countries last week to the resolution to stop the blockade on Cuba, which is being imposed by the imperialist United States of America. But that resolution is not being implemented. But we know as a matter of fact that all the resolutions and outcomes of the 20th Congress CPC will become practical actions and uh, will touch the lives of all the people. And the, the significance of the CPC Congress arises out of the fact that the CPC is leading what currently is globally the second biggest economy and will in all our lifetime become the world's biggest economy. And there is an undeniable the denial fact that, that the Chinese economy in terms of whatever systems and theoretical framework and tools of analysis we use, is on its way towards being the biggest economy in the entire world. And its significance will, of course, uh, continue to be relevant. And the growth and rapid development of China, one is because of the strategic and decisive leadership of the Communist Party of China. But also its basic logic that China's economy must be the biggest in the world because it is the biggest population. So under normal circumstances, 1.3 billion people will demand more goods, will need more food, need more houses, there will be much bigger exchanges of goods and services, which in these basic economic terms it's this growth demonstrates domestic product. So it will automatically become the most important because the population of China is the biggest in the world. It's one geopolitical space which is organized with 1.3 billion people. That is more than the entire population of the African continent. So, that, so the logic therefore follows that China's economy has to be the uh, biggest economy in the world. But also the other significance of this Congress is that it happened amidst the provocation by the imperialist West to try to sponsor and support the secessionists in Taiwan. Because they are those who are thinking that Taiwan should be defined outside of the People's Republic of China. And the sole purpose of that so the Americans and the group of seven new colonial countries, the G7, think that the PRC minus Taiwan will not become the biggest economy in the world. The force that has to be reckoned with. So the, the opportunists are now trying to sponsor the secessionist elements within Taiwan, something which all the progressive forces in the world should... Uh, 
oppose, we should be on the side of a unified China with all its uh, special administrative zones and all its components. But, but the most important thing is that as a Marxist-Leninist political party, the EFF, we appreciate, the, <laughs> we appreciate that as part of the political report to, and the report to the CPC Congress, the General Secretary says that our experience has taught us that at a fundamental level, we owe the success of our party and socialism with Chinese characteristics to the fact that Marxism works. That is what he says. So whatever you imagine could be the primary ingredient of why is the Communist Party of China successful and why is the PRC successful. The general secretary says it's because of Marxism, which the EFF ascribes to. It says it's Marxism that has got, and he said this as well, uh, when the Communist Party of China was celebrating its 100th anniversary last year, he said that the Communist Party of China has accomplished so many tasks which were thought to be impossible by other political forces. The reason for this has been precisely attributed to our adoption of Marxism as our guide of action. And that is what we basically got to emphasize. And perhaps so that we are all together in terms of what this means, let's, let's, let's go a little bit back and make a reflection on the, what Deng Xiaoping said in 1984 in the period of the opening up, in the phases which the CG spoke about, about in terms of the phases in the history of the Communist Party of China. He once wrote the perspective of socialism with Chinese characteristics. And then he said that what is socialism and what is Marxism? Deng Xiaoping, and then he says that we are not quite clear about this in the past. Then he says that Marxism attaches utmost importance to developing and development of the productive forces. So when you speak about development of the productive forces, this thing of teaching now is overwhelming me. The, the <laughs> of political education. So the development of the productive forces means that you must grow the components of the economy in all the sectors. Like it's growth, it's economic growth. Then he says that Marxism attaches utmost importance to development of the productive forces. And then he says that this calls for highly developed productive forces and therefore an overwhelming abundance of material wealth. This is a fundamental task for the socialist stage that you primarily have to develop the productive forces. And he says, there's one thing, he says that the superiority of a socialist system is demonstrated in the final analysis by faster and greater development of those forces than under a capitalist system. So when you are building infrastructure and building industries without a narrow profit motive, that happens faster than when it is done for profit purposes. This explains why not only China, but also Vietnam, which is led by the Communist Party of Vietnam, got to realize faster development that has never been witnessed in the history of humanity proper application of Marxist, Leninist tools of analysis and guide to action, which guide the economic emancipation movement here in South Africa. In terms of what happened, like, let's just give a background of, so on the 6th of October, the Commander-in-Chief and President of the EFF, Julius Malima, wrote to General Secretary Xi Jinping, wishing the Communist Party of China went for the 20th Congress. And then the, on the 26th of October, when the Congress was concluded, we issued a public statement as the EFF welcoming wholly the re-election of General Secretary Xi Jinping as the General Secretary of the Communist Party. I will give a context of why that is the case. And on the 1st of November, we presented a parliamentary motion like a motion to congratulate the CPC for a successful Congress and to congratulate the General Secretary Xi Jinping. And that motion was adopted uh, by Parliament. And in terms of process, Parliament must now be on behalf of all members of Parliament write to the CPC 
and to uh, the General Secretary conveying our congratulatory message as the Parliament of South Africa. I'm saying we welcome the whole the re-election of General Secretary Xi Jinping because like uh, Chairman Mao Zedong, General Secretary Xi Jinping has paid particular attention to the development of the African economy and to the development of all the developing nations. So the so under Chairman Mao, the Chinese government through financing and the actual construction, the speaker who spoke just now made a brief reflection on that, constructed a 1,860 kilometer railway project from Zambia to Tanzania. It's called the Uhuru Railway. Like it's called the Tanzania Zambia Railway Authority, Tazara. It's still operational now. It is the biggest rail project. So, so 1,860 kilometers is distance that is longer than the furthest part of South Africa, which is Musina to Cape Town. But the Chinese government, with its resources, with its passion labor working with the Tanzanians and the Zambians, got to to construct one of the most important infrastructure programs in the African continent, just to build the relationship. And the reason why we had, they had to connect Southern Africa with East Africa at that time, from 1970 to 1975, is because in 1970, Rhodesia was not Zimbabwe. It was still under the colonial rule of Ian Smith. South Africa was still under apartheid. So majority of the inland countries did not have access to the coastlines, particularly for trade purposes. So a freight and passenger rail project with assistance of China was built from Zambia to Tanzania, which uh, in Dar es Salaam has got the coastline, uh, which still anchors the economies of the entirety of East Africa currently. But that is not the only thing which the Chinese government has got to participate in in the African continent. So there is a 760 kilometers standard gauge rail project from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to Djibouti. So Djibouti is the near, nearby a coastal country next to Djibouti. And it has got to add a lot of meaningful value in the development of the Ethiopian economy. So the Ethiopian economy, by the way, has been growing at average 10% for the past 15 years. But no one gets to even say, why well, not paying attention as to how has Ethiopia got to use much more meaningfully its relationship with China to grow its economy at average 10%, which resulted in higher life expectancy and development of the productive forces broadly in terms of uh, what gets to be realized in that part of the world. The bridge that got to connect the Populations which were divided by a river between Katembe and Maputo and Mozambique was built with the assistance of the Chinese. The bridge, which is called the Nyerere Bridge in Tanzania, in Kigang, Kigang Mbolo, which, to, because we had a situation where a river would divide even a country, like, and the way those systems, and then the Chinese played a role in terms of uh, that. The, the first phase industrial parts in Algeria is built with the assistance of China. The special economic zones in the Suez Canal in Egypt, one of the most dynamic special economic zones in the entire world, is built in collaboration with the People's Republic of China. The new capital city of uh, Egypt, which is going to be worth 50 billion US dollars, you can calculate what that is in rent terms, it's under construction now with the participation of China, which has had some clear experience in terms of constructing of new cities and infrastructure, uh, that gets to happen. I know Tanzania is going to relocate its uh, capital city from Dar es Salaam to Dodoma, and the Chinese government and companies, which are state-owned, are going to play a role in the construction of the new capital city of Tanzania in Dodoma. So there are so many projects, you can just give a highlight, the housing project in Angola and Zambia and a variety of other meaningful interventions 
that are being uh, made. But there are issues, of course, which I think we as South Africa should maximally look into. In April, this year, the ambassador of China to South Africa had said that the Chinese people and government and institutions would be willing to participate in the construction of a, like, the speed rail, like bullet rail project from the coastal provinces to inland, specifically saying Deben to Johannesburg. I would think that there has to be a purposeful pursuit of building that project, a standard gauge project which must interconnect the major modal points in South Africa, but also the aim of linking that standard gauge rail project to the entire African continent. Because in Agenda 2063 of the African Union, we say that priority number one is to have an interconnected Africa through rail so that we're able to increase, enhance, and harness intra-African trade, which currently is too minimal. And China is the only, unfortunately, is the only, oh, fortunately, because it's our friend, is the only country that can interlock and interlink the African continent through a rail project with the experience that they've got to gain over time and turn around times which are much more meaningful in terms of uh, what happens. But then the other issue, which of course is of significance, is uh, the export and import baskets between South Africa and China, or broadly the entire African continent, must begin to change so that we also build industries and export finished goods and products to China. Because if you check now, our top imports from China, it's electronic equipment and products, it's finished clothing products, it's a variety of things which are already finished. And our top exports to China is raw and semi-processed goods and services. We have to change that because we, we too, as the African continent, should engage in industrialization which is going to uplift our lives because there has never been a country except the oil-rich nations in the Emirates which have got to develop without proper pursuit of industrialization. And China is a strategic partner because out of that 1.3 billion population, we have got approximately 600 million, if not more, that has got disposable income, buying power. So if we were to build meaningful industries here, China is a destiny for our exports of finished goods and services in collaboration, which in turn is going to grow the uh, entire economy. I, I think that is uh, some of the immediate issues that we can deal with. But a much more sustainable and proper, believable, practical solution is to vote the EFL into power here so that we can lead a development of the African economy and make sure that we maximize on this relationship that we have with China. Thank you very much.